Welcome back, those of you who are here in person, and welcome to those who are joining us over Zoom. My name is Benjamin Paloff. I'm the director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies at the uh, University of Michigan. And this is the beginning of our third panel in our day-long symposium, Building Bridges Over Walls, East, uh, Eastern European Literatures and Midwestern uh, Translation Networks. Uh, our third meeting is entirely virtual uh, due to, well, the circumstances of the world. Uh, the, uh, originally, the plan was, uh, well, to be quite honest, we're, it's kind of miraculous that <laughs> any of this comes together at all because just uh, four weeks ago or so, uh, with the Omicron variant, we weren't entirely sure how we were going to put this together. And I'm very grateful to those of you who have contributed for your flexibility and your, your understanding. Um, we have two wonderful speakers for our next panel, uh, which is on Tamizdat. I expect this will be a rather informative panel for many of you who may have only uh, a vague understanding of this phenomenon or, or perhaps uh, no uh, familiarity what, with it whatsoever. But when we refer to Tamizdat, this is a, a slight play on words based on the word samizdat, which might be more familiar, samizdat being underground publishing, uh, generally in places where uh, the literature being published would be uh, illegal or risky. Uh, tamizdat, uh, moving from the uh, Slavic root sam, meaning self, to the Slavic word tam, meaning over there, tamizdat is the publishing of that uh, banned literature in another location and then very often smuggled back into the place where it had been banned initially. Uh, we have two of the world's foremost uh, scholars uh, on this phenomenon uh, speaking to us today, uh, and I will introduce them in the order uh, that they are speaking. Uh, Jessie Lebov, who will go first, uh, I believe because she currently has quiet in her home, um, is Director of Academic and Institutional Development at McDaniel College Budapest and researcher in the Institute for Literary Studies of the Eötvös Loránd Research Network, formerly known as the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. She is the author of Transatlantic Central Europe, uh, which Central European University Press published in 2019, and co-editor with Friedrike uh, Kind uh, Kovac of Samizdat, Tamizdat, and Beyond, published by Berg, uh, Bergon Books in 2013. As vice chair of the NEP4 Dissent Cost Action, her current work focuses on new approaches to Samizdat and Tamizdat through digital history. And I should also note, even though she didn't put it in her own biographical note, that she was for many years a professor of Eastern European literatures at uh, uh, Ohio State University. So another uh, strong upper Midwestern connection. Uh, after Jesse speaks, we will hear from uh, Yaakov Klotz. Yasha is assistant professor of Russian at Hunter College and the uh, CUNY Graduate Center uh, in New York, where he teaches a variety of courses on Russian literature and culture and curates the Russian and East European Cultures at Hunter series. He is also the director of the Tamizdat Project, a public scholarship initiative devoted to the first publications, reception, and circulation of contraband Russian literature abroad. And uh, I can say quite shamelessly that, it, that the format, the digital online format of the Tamizdat Project is something, I would say it inspired us as we were putting together our own online exhibit, but uh, a more accurate description would be that I just kind of stole uh, Yasha's idea. Um, his most recent book project is Poets in New York on City Language Diaspora, which was published by uh, Nova Literaturne Bazrenia in Moscow in 2016. And his monograph, Tamizdat, the Cold War and Contraband Russian Literature, is forthcoming in English in 2023. So uh, we will, those of us who are gathered here, will be visiting with our, our uh, colleagues on the screen. And those of you joining us over Zoom will be, uh, will be uh, experiencing, experiencing these talks over Zoom as well. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Jesse, I believe you're first. 
Okay, thank you. Let me uh, share away here. Let's see. I should have something like a title slide up. Please let me know if I don't. <laughs> um, before I start on the subject of Tommy style, I just wanted to say one word about the Mellon Sawyer seminar because I was involved in one um, at Ohio State. Uh, ben had mentioned I had been there for eight years or so. And I was involved in a Mellon Sawyer seminar uh, comparing the Balkans in South Asia. And it was literally, without any exaggeration, the most exciting intellectual experience of my time at Ohio State. And it just, it reformatted all of us about how we thought about our colleagues and their work. So I, I'm just very glad that you guys get to experience it as well and even more happy to be a part of it. Um, I'm gonna be talking along with Yasha about Tommy's dad in the Cold War. And it didn't occur to me until Ben started talking that maybe I should go into a little bit more background. Um, I'll try to do that along the way. But um, let me just introduce the three areas I'm gonna discuss. I'm gonna talk about Tommy's dot um, as a surrogate press, which is a pretty classical understanding of what it is um, and how that worked. Um, I'm going to talk about it as an echo chamber, which is a bit of an extension, and explain how that, how Tommy's dot as a phenomenon, we can call it the Tommy's dot phenomenon, can extend uh, much beyond just simply printed material. And then in the last uh, section of this very short talk, I'm going to try to explain how I see it um, acting as um, testimony to ongoing events uh, in reference to today even. So that's the shape that this is supposed to take. When I move into a discussion of Tommy's dot as surrogate press, I should explain that one of the reasons that I'm here at this particular event is because that book that Ben mentioned, um, Transatlantic Central Europe, uh, began as my dissertation on this yearbook. And we heard a really lovely uh, discussion this morning from Herbert Eagle about how uh, Laislav Mateka uh, came to this yearbook and why he produced it. Um, I just want to explain that most people would not consider Cross Currents, this enormous yearbook, which is, you know, uh, eight and a half by 11 and quite heavy, classical Tommy's that because it's not designed to be snuck into somebody's pocket and then smuggled across the Iron Curtain back into Eastern Europe. But the way I understand Tamistat, um, it is a, a mode of reproducing texts for their consumption in either East or Western during the Cold War, simply to broadcast and disseminate the work of people, um, in this case, behind the Iron Curtain. Now, the connection to the Midwest, you will see in a moment when I show you um, just the first page of the table of contents of the first uh, edition of Cross Currents. Uh, I should mention that um, it came out once a year for 12 years. And each year it was a force of nature um, and Mateka that put together uh, a whole kaleidoscope of perspectives on Central and Eastern Europe, including Southeastern Europe. Um, the connection to the Midwest can often be found in the table of contents because you'll notice many um, colleagues represented, uh, well, specifically from Michigan, but not just from Michigan, um, from a lot of the surrounding universities as well, as well as figures um, from the region. So what we have here, if you like to think of it as a network, is a network binding together scholars. Um, I call them intellectual activists people we sometimes call dissidents um, and sometimes simply call writers. And of course, uh, translators. They're not always listed in the table of contents, but they're there and they're at least mentioned in the text. When I did a long format interview with uh, Mateka, a series of them in the late nineties and early two thousands, we talked enormously about translation and how he managed to get translations and how he managed to beg, borrow and steal, how he asked, various translators for great favors um, to turn these texts into something that the Western audience could consume, and sometimes the afterlives of these texts in other formats. So that's just to give you an idea of how I understand cross currents, just once again, I'll go back to the strong cover image as a surrogate medium. What it's doing is it's creating a canon, if you will, a canon that doesn't exactly exist anywhere else. It's creating in the, in the context of the Midwest, um, but clearly 
clearly the audience is meant to move uh, far beyond that. Okay, so that's just the first context I wanted to discuss. The second one is that of echo chamber. And here I'm getting more into what I call the tummy that function. So yes, it reproduces texts and brings them to a wider audience, but I claim it also amplifies that text. And here I'm gonna draw on um, Frederica Kintkovac's work and she has an entire book devoted to the concept of Tamizdat and she's focused on various methods um, by which underground literature crossed the curtain from west to east. So um, the one that she perhaps became most uh, widely known for was her work on the radios, on Radio Free Liberty and Radio, uh, Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, but she focuses on Radio Free Europe as her main study. Um, here's just a, a quote from uh, Kintkovac's work where she understands the radios as an extension of Tamizdat. And for those of you that are tied to the printed phenomenon, I'm sure I've already lost you. But the way that Federica and I understand uh, Tamizdat, it's really all of the different media that's been out of the urge to republish as surrogate press. So here, um, I just took a few of her quotes. I mentioned, um, she claims that radio provided the single truly influential link between the literary underground and the world of Western ideas. So it's not just about people hearing texts, but also reconceptualizing them. And this term echo chamber for what radio is doing um, with Tamizdat texts and Samizdat texts um, goes way back uh, to the 70s. And so what did that mean, an echo chamber? It doesn't just mean that texts and ideas from the West go to the East. It means that the way we understand it, that uh, resonance and amplification is moving back and forth, sometimes with distortion, sometimes with feedback. So it is about the amplification of voices from inside. Yes, it's about the translation of voices from inside. Um, whereas Radio Free Europe simply amplified voices in the language of these countries, um, the texts that were then translated and published in journals like Cross Currents. These are the ones that we come to understand as Western Tamistat. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna give you an example from the 1980s, and this is maybe how we might uh, recognize when this phenomenon of the echo chamber is happening. Um, sort of revolving door, I call it, between Cross Currents and then uh, much wider disseminated publications such as New Yorker, New York Review of Books. Um, these venues for the voices of people from Central Eastern Europe, especially, became very important in the amplification of their voices. And, and in fact, if it hadn't been for that revolving door, if Cross Currents had only existed as a yearbook that scholars read and their students read um, in the Midwest, I don't think it would have the importance that it does today. So that revolving door into wider um, distribution formats was really important. And then this is the last piece of the puzzle. And I, I went far beyond the Cold War to talk about this. Um, when I speak of an echo chamber, I also mean what we might call now a kind of CCing. So I'm gonna use an example from the 2000s where the historian Jan Gross um, was talking about how his book Neighbors, uh, which was a study of um, Polish uh, violence um, against Jewish neighbors um, in the beginning of World War II, he, he pointed out that when he published it in Poland, it didn't get that much attention. But then when he translated it into English and published it in New York, it suddenly got a huge amount of attention in Poland. And so here we see that sometimes the act of translation specifically into what we might say as a world language or a trade language, um, where many more readers can access it, can have the function of also making it more important um, in the original. And so translation is not just about people from the outside reaching inside, but also heightening the importance inside. Okay, I'm moving into the last section of this discussion. Tamis is testimony. And here we get into some of the um, ethical and political meanings of Tamis beyond just access. So I'll start with um, the representation of Jewish voices from the region. So. In its uh, fourth year of publication, Cross Currents uh, for in 1985, 
uh, Mateka and all of the people working with him decided to focus on uh, Jewish issues. And this is not specifically about any um, current movement as much as a kind of a nostalgic and uh, rather melancholic picture. And I'm just showing you the images as opposed to the texts um, relevant to that, that project. And it's really about finding the role of Jewish identity within the larger concept of Central European identity. That's, that's what this discussion was about. But it has, uh, as you see, a rather testimonial feel, not just pointing out the presence of Jewish culture, but also the neglect of Jewish culture in this context. Another form of testimony would be in Cross Currents 1990, um, simply articles reflecting on the changes, on the transformation on the wall. But um, where I think that this gets uh, particularly meaningful for Cross Currents and for what the journal represents to me as Tamizdat is in the 1990s. So Cross Currents 12, which was the last edition of it, focused very specifically on the wars in the former Yugoslavia. And um, I'm just gonna show you a short photo essay about the, the destruction of Dubrovnik, um, which was published and the entire journal was uh, in one way or another, the entire yearbook was devoted to this issue with a few small exceptions, but this photo essay is really trying to document um, the destruction of physical objects, but also the destruction of culture. And the essays revolve around the relationship between writers and politics. So coming to a conclusion here about all of this, I claim that Tami's not um, through the first very initial act of surrogate publication, um, canon, say salvation in some cases, and canon supplementation through translation, through this kind of documentation, really is a response to uh, a need to speak for those, to publish for those who are not being heard or read, right? It's about offering a voice to those that are not being able to speak or are speaking but are not being heard. So this is where we have the link to the public sphere, I think, um, far, far beyond simply providing access for scholars of Russian literature or scholars of Polish literature or Central European identity. This is about allowing the voices to be amplified and to be heard. So it's not just about discovery, which is what I think kind of a mistake that we make when we're acting as detectives looking for old editions of this and that. It wasn't just about necessarily making things accessible and discovering unexplored texts, but also representing cultures, representing literary movements, philosophical movements um, that hadn't for one reason or another been discovered. And this is also um, my last point, the link to today. So when I first imagined presenting to this audience and talking about uh, Tami's dad, I was thinking of all of the different phenomenon that I see in, in in reporting and documentation, in surrogacy, um, in the press online today, as people try in different ways to represent voices in Ukraine and in Russia and in Belarus, uh, Belarus, sorry. So I think that what we are seeing are people attempting to do similar types of ethical responses, especially about areas of the world they're invested in, but through the medium that they have um, access to today. So that's just my last reflection, uh, bringing us to the moment that we're in and it was just in time to thank you. Thank you, Jesse, that was wonderful. Um, I... Jesse. Jesse, I hope you could. I hope you could hear that. I usually, you know, normally when we have a Zoom presentation, the, then you know, the, there's like silence. So I, I had the microphone on, so you could hear the the applause. Um, thank you for that wonderful presentation, which also um, brings to the foreground something that has been kind of in the, was in the background, uh, an undercurrent in both of the morning panels, which is the human rights dimension of this kind of work. This is not simply literary production, which is, which is valuable in its own right, 
but it's literary production with a, with a, as, as you said, an activist dimension, um, which I hope we'll be able to discuss uh, throughout the day. Um, so if you could just hold, hold on, uh, Jesse, we will uh, invite uh, Yasha Klotz to give his presentation. Uh, hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me. And Benjamin, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to this extremely important and, should I say, unfortunately timely um, uh, discussion. And Jesse, it's a pleasure to hear you as always. This sends me back to uh, the Thomas Dodd conference that we had more than three years ago at Hunter College, uh, which was a beginning of, or a continuation, of course, rather of, of, of this topic, but it's very eerie to see how all these subjects of our scholarship are turning really into um, activism, uh, because what I was going to, uh, to say, uh, to talk about today, uh, needs, of course, um, to be amended. Much as my own book that uh, Benjamin just announced <laughs> that it will be forthcoming in a year or so from today, of course, it also needs to be amended just after I submitted it, the final version a couple of months ago only. Uh, and this is maybe I would like to start kind of at the end, uh, at the end of what I had to say in the introduction uh, to the book on Tam is that situated during the Cold War period and also sort of thematically confined or limited to uh, prison camp narratives, which were of course the hottest right topic of the Cold War. So uh, let me uh, do this, let me quote, I mean, read, say uh, what I had to say in the last two paragraphs and then I hope it might serve kind of as a platform uh, for all of us, but for me, definitely uh, a bubble to rethink uh, this in the context of the events of just the past three weeks or so. Uh, what I wrote in the last paragraph uh, sounds like this, uh, a, jo a joint venture of the diaspora and Western institutions, time is that remained firmly inscribed in Soviet literary history until the curtain was lifted. The political mission of Tam is that then became obsolete. Having lost much of its politically oriented readership, Tam is that has gone into history, prompting the writer um, Zinovi Zinik and a third wave emigre author himself to claim that it is only now or rather then, um, during and after Perestroika, that is beyond the political context that the genuine literary motifs of exile and emigration, and by extension of Tam is that started floating to the surface. And so much so, uh, to quote Zinik, that in this sense, Russian Amy Gray literature is only starting, end of quote. Uh, what I say then is, there is, however, another reason to look back at the years when Tam is that took shape, that is, the years of uh, the, the late 1950s and early 60s, mainly the 60s. Um, today, 30 years after the end of the Cold War, we are witnessing a resurgence of its rhetoric and worse reenactments of some of its most austere policies on both the international and local scales. Still, the post-Soviet thaw of the 90s, as it may now be called, made Tam is that obsolete, of course, not only politically, but also technologically. It introduced an entirely new path or technique for clandestine texts to go live, bypassing not only state censorship, but also geographical borders, however open they may have become by the 90s. From then on, geography and space itself seem to have hardly mattered as they have become virtual, while the time previously required by a typical time is that operation has also shrunk to just a few clicks. Yet while in the early days of the internet, cyberspace seemed to be free and open, the ultimate freedom of speech incarnate as it was conceived of, uh, today, quote, it is <clears throat> being fought over, divided up and closed off behind protective barriers, suggesting an eerie return to the geopolitical realities of the Cold War when the world was divided. And the, this quote came from uh, Robert Bar Barton's book, Censors at Work, which was 
in fact, mainly devoted to uh, France some three centuries ago. In case we forgot, Thomas Dodd serves as a reminder that, again, a quote from Darton, the power of print could be as threatening as cyber warfare. And in fact, it was more. So one uh, auxiliary verb, so to say, that clearly needs to be changed uh, is not was, but I, 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 I guess I'm, I dread to say is, uh, not to use any future tenses here. So <clears throat> I will be changing this clearly um, when the, uh, the edits arrive uh, from the press. So this still uh, brings me back uh, to having to say and to having, once again, to thank Jessie for um, her kind of amplification of the definition of Thomas that, that I worked with mainly. Uh, I looked at Thomas Dodd mainly as a third kind of counterpart, right, to the two uh, domestic and much more familiar and better researched uh, fields, right, of cultural production during the Soviet era, that is Goss's that uh, state publishing and some is that uh, self-publishing. Tam is that, which is, uh, forgive the pun, is what some of the some is that, right, um, something that happened to some of the some is that. Uh, it, it is, it, 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 it introduces, um, clearly a transnational, transcontinental, international dynamic to this somewhat dated and clearly too binary of a model, right, of late Soviet culture as an opposition between the official and unofficial, because time is that uh, combines both. Uh, it is its source, its main source are uh, the clandestine or contraband manuscripts from the Soviet underground, or more largely from the East European underground, but of course the phenomenon is not limited to those times and places. Think of Germany of the Reformation era. Uh, and yet it does bring them out in a pretty official form, right? With all the credentials and for sale, of course, and for the libraries and later with uh, ISBNs, et cetera, et cetera. So in this sense, yes, it's uh, it's a surrogate press, and that's uh, very impressive in my view uh, way to think of Tam is that, as well as an echo chamber. If we include into uh, the definition of Tam is that uh, such other media as the radio, um, and perhaps uh, the others as well. Uh, clearly, it's mainly a representation of the voices, right, and a representation almost in the legal sense. Um, so the um, <clears throat> one kind of caveat here is uh, I was quoting Zinovi Zinik, uh, his idea that emigre literature is only starting right when emigration itself ceases to uh, to be reality, right? Something that is actually happening. Unfortunately, today again, of course, it is happening yet again. Um, but uh, my project, Tam is that project, and my book uh, deals with attempts to divorce uh, the so-called emigre literature, literature of the Russia abroad, or Poland abroad, or the Czech Republic abroad. Uh, that is literature of the diasporas, and Tam is that uh, per, se, per se, which um, means that to be considered time is that according to the definition that I'm using uh, a text right needs to uh, migrate uh, to cross the border at least once on the way out as a manuscript uh, from the drawer to publication on its way to the reader and uh, to make the circle okay, for the political mission of time is that complete, it crosses the same border back, right? So it crosses the same border twice back, clearly as a publication, no longer as a manuscript. Uh, and when we talk, when we talk about the formative years of time is that, that is 
um, not necessarily even going back to Zhivago, perhaps going back to 1929 uh, to Evgeny Zamyatin and Boris Pilniak, because this is when uh, the state really declares its mono monopoly on publishing. This is when Gosses that becomes the monopoly. Um, when we talk about these formative years and um, the global network industry, if, even if you'd like, of Tam is that, uh, of course, uh, well, it, it, it was from the very beginning, it was um, not only a transnational and transcontinental, <clears throat> but also translingual uh, phenomenon, right? So um, suffice it to say that both Zamyatin's we and Dr. Zhivaga by Pasternak, not to mention so many other examples, first saw the light of day as publications in foreign languages, in translation. Um, yeah, uh, so, so, and not even uh, Dr. Zhivago was first published in Italian in Italy. Uh, Zamyatin's we were, was first published in New York in English. Uh, Evgenia Ginsburg's Krutoi Marshut was first published again in Italian, sometimes simultaneously with the publications of the original, but uh, there is really no pattern here as to which language comes first, the uh, original or the translation. Uh, during those years, and I, of course, I want to focus in the time I have left on, on the upper Midwest, specifically on, on Ann Arbor and Ardis, right, which uh, is the only published house of such caliber of uh, the next generation of Tamistad. Uh, so the previous generation, of course, consisted largely of the Russian diaspora, right, of, of first wave emigres, of uh, second wave emigres as well. Uh, and it was not really until Argus uh, until the early 70s and the so-called third wave of, of the Russian immigration with which Argus uh, overlapped and allied um, aesthetically, stylistically, and of course, politically, ideologically, but mainly simply chronologically. Uh, so it was not until then that uh, the publication of clandestine literary manuscripts um, became re really a literary practice right until then uh, it was it, it, it was hard to say what, what it was what more uh, whether it was a literary practice or a political institution uh, so this political institutional aspect of tam is that became started changing shifting towards the literary uh, um, literary end of that spectrum uh, with artists, right, who were, um, once again, uh, definitely the largest, probably definitely the most, most devoted uh, press, not run by uh, Russian emigres. Uh, after all, Karl Profer was a native of the Midwest. And uh, also, <clears throat> in the sense that nearly half of its titles, of artists' titles, were in English, uh, which is, of course, why they, uh, until a certain point, they were allowed to participate in Moscow book fairs and were considered a complex phenomenon, as Ellen Dea Proffer likes to uh, call herself and Carol Proffer, uh, quoting that official designation or semi-official unspoken and yet nevertheless coming from the Soviet literary authorities in relation to artist publishers whom they tolerated precisely because uh, it was not limited to um, their function was not limited to the political one. They also translated Soviet authors and of course had a whole series of reprints of um, Silver Age poems. And yet uh, they, they, they were not the first, they, they simply dealt, handled uh, the whole operation and the manuscripts on, on this purely textological level differently uh, compared to their predecessors. So Zoykina Kvartira, which is Zoya's apartment by Mikhail Bulgakov, which is considered to be one of the first 
uh, if not, no, it wasn't the first, but it was literally maybe second or third book title, uh, a separate edition by brought out by Ardis. It had been published in Tamizdat previously, uh, the same play by Bulgakov. Uh, it was published in Novy Journal, but the whole context, right, the, the, the entire kind of Jesse spoke of the echo chamber, but I can also add that it was also an ecosystem, right? Uh, that climate, uh, which defines the ecosystem, or vice versa, uh, was very different. And it was not until literally 1971 when Ardis was founded that it began changing and remained such uh, more or less until Perestroika, until those times when Tamizdat became obsolete and passed into history. Uh, let me, uh, if I have just one more second, I wanted to, uh, sorry, uh, to draw your attention to this project that Benjamin uh, generously mentioned. Um, switch to the English version. Uh, yes, uh, almost uh, every other time you, re you refresh the main page, only in the first kind of row of four titles, right? Uh, you, you, you would almost, almost always see Argus uh, book covers. So it is, it is a public, uh, public scholarship initiative. It is open and to anyone uh, without any, uh, any necessary kind of VPNs or logins so far at least. Uh, and I should say that it would never be possible, of course, without the generous help and contributions of multiple, multiple volunteers uh, from all over the world who bring in their visions and different backgrounds, linguistic ones and interests. Uh, and when you go to the kind of galleries of publishers, of course, this is all a work in progress and this needs to have a more detailed and it will have a more detailed kind of entry on each publisher, including Argus. At least so far, you can see some of the titles. Again, this is not an exhaustive gallery, but it gives you some idea simply on a visual kind of book design level, uh, which is a fascinating aspect of Tamizdat, just how uh, those Tamizdat editions in Russian or in whichever translation because Argus, again, published translations, not only larger uh, American or Western publishers, such as Harper and Roll. Uh, it is, having looked at them, you know, often enough, uh, it is almost possible to tell uh, whether it's a Thomas Dutt publication even by the spine when you just simply go through the stacks. Um, but the project also pulls up different um, sorry, I do not have an English translation of this excerpt uh, from personal correspondence yet, but I can briefly summarize it. So uh, this is a letter from Gleb Struve, um, someone whose contribution to Tamis Dat in the early years is hard to underestimate, to um, another fellow emigre, Yuri Ivask, a poet, uh, in Amherst at the time in 1972. So this is literally a couple of weeks before Brodsky arrives in the West, right? And about a year since the founding of Ardis. Uh, and this is a private piece of correspondence, uh, which nevertheless, I believe, uh, well, and I do have the permission to quote. Um, <clears throat> So Tam is that project which you're looking at is essentially an online archive of documents. So one of those documents goes like this, that it pretty much discusses in rather poignant uh, terms, of course, right? Personally, uh, the proffers, uh, but this one is perhaps the key, this last um, sentence that uh, me, myself and Filipov, Boris Filipov, cannot find uh, the funds to continue our publishing venture, uh, even though I'm kind of prompted and tempted uh, by someone in Russia to bring out a two volume edition of Voloshan. Uh, so what's Truva uh, 
refers to here is Interlanguage Literary Associates, which was the publishing house that brought out the Brodsky's first book edition in 1965, right? The second Brodsky's book, Astanovka v Pustynia, Halt in the Desert, was published in 1970, and both were published before Brodsky's emigration. So when Brodsky does arrive in 72, literally a couple of weeks after this letter is written, um, it becomes this very kind of charged and very liminal and significant, important transitional um, encounter, right, of a previous, previously a Tamis dot author with uh, his first Tamis dot publishers and with his, of course, future uh, main publishers that are this ever since uh, was, right? And those kind of nodes or intersections of different generations, but also different stylistic and aesthetic formations, which is probably more important. Uh, this, this is what Tom is that uh, can tell us something about. Uh, and this after all is, uh, and not an insignificant chapter uh, of literary history. Uh, with its own specificities, uh, whether we are talking about Russian literary history or Polish literary history. And even those will, of course, inevitably intersect, for instance, Kultura uh, and Institut Literatsky in Paris. After all, they were the ones who first published Sinyavsky and Daniel, right? Uh, and they were also the ones who received those manuscripts, and only from there would they um, be disseminated further in and into different languages, etc. So um, once again, I'll I have to stop here, uh, but I'll gladly answer any questions. And uh, once again, uh, very grateful for for, for 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 this event we are having today. Thanks. Thank you, Yasha. And we do have time for um, questions for both of our panelists. Uh, if you are joining us over Zoom, please uh, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, our panelists may or may not, my, the panelists are not, don't need to, to monitor that. I will monitor that myself. Um, panelists themselves don't get to put questions in the Q&A, but you can put them in chat and I will monitor that as well. We also have some questions from uh, potentially from people in the audience or comments. I think there is a question from uh, Russell. Yes, I see that one as well. And, um, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll feed that to you. Um, Russell Scott Valentino, who will be speaking in the afternoon, says, uh, asks whether Jessie uh, might speak a little bit more about what she means when she refers to feedback and distortion, maybe with an example or two. And, and also a question regarding the definition of just trying to define Tom is dot, because it seems that what Artis was doing fits pretty well, but Dalkey archive on the whole um, does not. And would you agree, Jesse uh, or Yasha and Yasha with that assessment? Um, I'll start quickly and say that uh, my definitions are always expansive and inclusive and they're under no circumstances would I exclude Dalkey's work from what I consider tummy stuff because in fact, it's a great example, if you will, of that kind of amplification. Um, <sighs> and canon building, really. Uh, so maybe when I was talking about the work of specific emigres, it might have sounded like people that were not part of that community were not producing Tommy's that, but I really do sincerely believe that everyone who's engaging with literatures that are underrepresented or not being read in this way are, are functioning in, in Tommy's that circumstances. Now, the question we might ask ourselves is, is that just every world literature that's not heard well enough or understood well enough? And here's where the the politicization of certain spheres of culture really do matter um, and the reasons why we might not be hearing. Um, and so that's why this term seems to be attached to this cultural sphere of activity. And certainly as Yasha beautifully illustrated has its own very specific history. So I wouldn't just throw it around for any culture at any time where somebody is not being represented but rather those that are originating from let's say everything from the beginning of the Soviet 
uh, state capture of culture all the way through the end of the Cold War and after in certain cases. So um, that would be my answer. Like, absolutely, Belki is a part of this phenomenon. And the distortion, I'll answer even more simply, is it's got to do, I think, with that amplification comes a lot of um, appropriations, political and cultural, um, of the meanings and the messages spoken from east to west and from west to east. So at times you have uh, triumphalist narratives taking over and saying, see, we told you that the Soviets are evil. Like, look at these dissidents, they're proving our point. At other times you have um, the misunderstandings in country. Uh, a very typical example of that is um, the Radio Free Europe broadcast to Hungary in 1956 that were very seriously misunderstood on the ground. So those are the kinds of distortions I'm usually talking about, although there are others, but that's enough for me. Uh, Benjamin, should I? Please. Uh -huh. uh, thank you, yes, for, for, for uh, these questions. I can, because uh, I have not really been working with the radio uh, medium, uh, nor have I actually been to the Radio Free Europe archives in Budapest, nor have I actually been to yet, uh, but I hope to be, uh, to the Arbis archives at the University of Michigan. Uh, but when we when we talk about distortions, it's of course, it, it, it's an entirely dependent on which medium, right? Uh, because media also have uh, their own kind of languages, right? And same technical specificities, but perhaps not only technical. So distortions as far as um, print publications are concerned are of at least three, can be of at least three uh, different kinds, I would say. One is simply you no know, technical, once again, typos and um, those unfortunate but ubiquitous um, mishaps right second uh is more of a kind of ideological nature uh especially when it comes to uh to to time is that of of that previous period that i talked about uh for instance yes i'm sure uh the version that of zoic in the quartier that Arvis brought out is textologically or textually uh different from the way it was published in Novi Journal, right? Uh, might only be a couple of years or 10 years earlier, and might even be from the same manuscript, right? So uh, the source text could have been, is something that needs to be checked, but it could have been identical. And yet ideological censorship in Tamis, that was unfortunately a reality. And in this sense, it is, truly a counterpart of Goss's that, right? Uh, and the joke goes that Tam is that was a Goss Dep is that, right? So Department of State is that type of thing uh, for ideological reasons. And the third mm, kind of distortions came from uh, aesthetic mm, discrepancies, right? Again, between not only between generations of uh, publishers in the West, but also between uh, representatives, let's say, of the same generation, except uh, across different, on, on the opposite sides of uh, the state borders and the curtain. Uh, for the, because due to the lack of, of course, communication, uh, right, that the Cold War era was notorious for, uh, for breaking something like communication. And uh, answering Russell's question about communication between different publishers, between different Thomas Dutt publishers with one another, of course, yes. In fact, uh, in Elendea Proffer's memoir, Brodsky Among Us, right, which is really a memoir about Tardis, uh, I'd say much more so than even about Brodsky, uh, she cites her, her and Carl Proffer's conversation with same aforementioned Gleb Struven, one of the American uh, bars or pubs before or literally on the eve of their takeoff for uh, Moscow during for their first ever uh, trip to the Soviet Union in 68. And uh, Struve's kind of postulate was that uh, 
was that it's it was unethical even to travel uh, because it was after months after the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. And therefore you should really think twice about even going there and boycott it, etc. cetera. Uh, nevertheless, what the Lindea Proffer has to say about this is that they were tired of their own American kind of ideological and not only ideological war warfare, Vietnam included. And that was even, so it's, it's clearly just simply opposite, you know, uh, points of view. Again, it's, uh, I'm afraid this is something that we will have to be dealing with uh, and probably are dealing with already uh, in our field and in our departments, in our professional associations of uh, Slavic, Eurasian, East European, uh, you name it. Um, yeah, but at the same time, of course, Tam is that is a lesson of how um, of how those voices that are, of course, being suppressed right now in Russia. In Russia. Yes. Uh, for some reason, I started hearing my own voice. <laughs> um, in any case, the echo effect right, is coming for you. Chamber. Anyway, uh, thanks. Yes. The, the, that actually segues beautifully, and I know we're, I'm mindful of the time, um, but we started a few minutes late. I'm hoping that, that you can, our panelists can stay with us for, for 10 minutes or so. Um, Sybil and Forrester, uh, who's joining us over Zoom and who's a, a marvelous translator uh, and contributor to this, this story, uh, uh, and, and those of you who, who view the online exhibit or look at the books that we have in person here will find some of her uh, phenomenal work and professor at, uh, at Swarthmore University, at Swarthmore College. Uh, she says, she asks uh, whether our guests can share their thoughts about how Thomas Dot supported certain kinds of scholarly work uh, outside of the Soviet Union up until the Glasnost area, and especially work on women writers and on dissidents or otherwise unapproved writers who were um, not only the objects of, let's say, editorial or publishing neglect in their home countries, but were also necessarily neglected by scholarship, that there was no academic work being done on them. Um, and yet that academic work was being done in the West because we had their books. Jesse, would you like to? Yeah, I was going to say, Yasha, you should start. And if I can add after for a minute, I will. OK, uh, this is also that Argus serves as a very good example for, because uh, first of all, it started with Russian literature three quarterly, right? Which was a journal. And it was not only a literary, but also an academic journal. It published articles. Uh, it was a venue that drove not only um gave voices not only to those artists right or authors uh writers poets prose writers but also to um scholars uh and it published even scholar in monographs uh as separate book editions so time is that was of course not limited to by genre uh it's maybe it's one of the hardest distinctions uh, that we can possibly come up with uh, when talking about Tam is that is to differentiate across genres, uh, however mixed those kind of genres were uh, in themselves. It was not limited to fiction, it was not limited to nonfiction, it was not limited to creative non so it included scholarship, it included once again transitioning to different media radio, it included uh, tapes or the sound, right? Uh, sound recordings, uh, even maps, even uh, all kinds of uh, designations that librarians use as type of material. Yeah, but scholarship for sure. 
But if, if I understood uh, Professor uh, Forrester's question, I think what she's asking is about even English language scholarship, that we could, that in the, oh. in, in, in the West, we were able to do scholarly work on writers because we had their work available because we were publishing it. I think that's what she was, she was asking about. Uh, clearly, of course, uh, because, well, we can't really say much uh, without having access to the source text. But it was also um, what drove it, I feel, is it's complicated because uh, there were other clearly extra literary reasons uh, for the boom, right, of Soviet Sovietology uh, in the late 60s. Academic exchange programs began literally a year after the Sputnik went up and after Khrushchev pronounced his anti-Stalinist secret speech and Right, so uh, everything was kind of coming together for for the enhancement of communication on all in all different forms and different levels, but communication, actual physical interpersonal communication, was of course still very limited, and uh, nevertheless there was this rising kind of study of uh, socialist bloc cultures, literatures, and languages. And those, all these students had to uh, very clearly have some texts to, to access to the texts to read and study. Uh, so it was a very pragmatic uh, um, enterprise, not only uh, aesthetic or creative. I'm having a hard time figuring out how to answer this question because there's a very uplifting answer and a very stifling one. So I'm going to give the hard answer because I think it's more interesting. And I understand emigre publication in general is an ego network. And in network science, that really means it's driven by specific people. Most of those people, as we know, were men, not all of them. but their vision of what uh, literary canons were was very subjective. <laughs> and um, we are spending most of today really admiring and, and complimenting their work. But I will say that that, that subjective canon building in, and I'm talking about a kaleidoscope of canons because many different people were involved really does reflect a very traditional and in many cases, conservative understanding of literary tradition and scholarship. So that's the stifling answer, but I would say the uplifting answer um, is that the people that brought me to this canon were largely uh, women and activist scholars and writers um, that were reinterpreting that canon very, very strongly. And some of them are speaking today. So I think that's good evidence of that. Well, I think that's I think that's about our time. Um, thank you both very much for your contributions to today's uh, celebration of uh, Upper Midwestern publishing and translation, and your very illuminating presentations. And um, we wish you were here with us in person so you could uh, enjoy lunch and mingle. But um, we uh, we hope to welcome you to campus in person in the in the not distant future. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, so please, if we could have a round of one more round of applause. And that concludes our um, morning program. Uh, we are going to break for about 45, 50 minutes for people to have lunch and coffee. Uh, we will reconvene at 2 p.m. Uh, for one more uh, panel, um, uh, and then uh, that uh, panel will be followed by a reading of poetry in translation by Claire Cavanaugh. So please, if you are joining us on Zoom, please come back uh, in about 45, 50 minutes, and uh, we look forward to seeing you virtually then. Thank you very much.